So this was originally sort of conceptualized because we hadn't told the community story for a while and we were coming to the end of a five-year funding round. Um, it was a five-year funding round that had the fires come through in the middle of it and some incredible challenges. We've delivered on that in absolute spades and delivered some fantastic outcomes and we wanted to share those outcomes. When I had a second think about it, I thought, well, actually, the community don't really care about the funding cycles. They just want to know the good things that we do. So let's, let's tell the stories that we do, but we can't tell all of them. So today we're going to have a look at uh, an oyster reef project. Um, Kim Lashmar is going to talk us through the narrow leaf Mallee Woodland Recovery Program. We've got the KI Dunnart story, which is a classic post-bushfire uh, post recovery story. We'll look at sustainable agriculture and also the feral cat eradication program. At the end of it, and possibly most importantly, there'll be half an hour for people to ask questions of us, because there's a hell of a lot of stuff that we won't cover today. So, you know, some of the other programs that won't be looked at. We do a lot of weed control. It's almost invisible because you don't notice what's not there. Um, but there's a hell of a lot of work that's done by, by Jason Walter um, and some contractors. There's a lot of work happening at the moment about Tasmanian bluegum wildland control. I imagine that one's reasonably topical for people. Um, there's a pig eradication program that's been running. We're doing a property management planning training course. There's a nursery that we run, which is uh, delivering some incredible results. We've got some black cockatoo program, water resource management, both the permanent inside of it and the value add side of it. And there's probably things that I've forgotten. So um, we won't look at everything today. We'll have a bit of a look at, the, at some of the bits. And as I say, at the end, there'll be about half an hour for people to ask questions about us if there, if there are questions. So I reckon that's probably enough. I could talk about where this fits within our strategic plan and yada yada, but our strategic plan's on the website. Really what matters is what happens on the ground and I think let's have a, have a bit of a look at that. So yeah, Alex Camino is our Oyster Reef Coordinator and we'll invite her up and she can talk us through this program. As I said, my name's Alex and I am the Project Coordinator for the Building Native Oyster Shellfish Reefs to Improve Habitat on Kangaroo Island, which has been a project funded through the Australian Government's Fisheries Habitat Restoration Fund. Um, and really our objective was to um, look at doing things differently. Shellfish reef restoration is still new to Australia. Um, it's got a bit of a history over in the States and to a degree in Europe. Um, but we wanted to see how we can build 20 low profile local native flat oyster reefs um, and do them, build them in a way that benefits the local community, the recreational fishers who live here and visit Kangaroo Island. Um, and at the same time, um, improve habitat for other species like threatened pipefish, sea dragons, and um, commercial fisheries as well. So in identifying our local restoration model, we've um, engaged with lots of recreational fishers, lots of um, different groups uh, of the uh, fisheries industries across Kangaroo Island um, and on the mainland as well. Um, and we've read through the sort of more novel approach that we've taken, we're contributing to the larger national initiative to restore these shellfish reefs across Australia, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then we've got an ongoing monitoring as well. So now the reefs are built, there is an ongoing component to make sure that they're still there, they're healthy, um, they're maintained, and to watch them progress and grow over the next, hopefully, decades to come. Um, so why oyster reefs? Uh, native oyster reefs were once all across um, south coast of uh, Australia, so from WA right around to um, halfway up the coast of New South Wales and all around Tasmania, so they were fairly expensive. And some of the um, benefits that they provided for us include habitat for fish and invertebrates. Like I said, that's a huge range of species that um, need that gap filled for them in their juvenile phase in particular. So. Um, linking up different kinds of habitat, seagrass, rocky reef, bare sands, and having these linkages for different life stages of fish. So it's one of the missing links, which we'll get to why it's been missing for the last 100 years or so. Um, other advantages, of course, um, oysters oops, filter water. So as they eat, they suck out all the different particles in the water column and they um, sort of aggregate everything, take out the bits they want and everything else they aggregate and put down on the sea floor. So they clean water as they go, making um, improving the water clarity for um, us and for the fish that live there. We've got um, at larger scales as well, um, these oyster reefs provide a buffer and um, stabilize the sediment and reduce erosion um, on shorelines as well. So again, we, we're talking at a small scale here, but at a larger scale, these are the sorts of benefits that um, have been lost across 
uh, Southern Australia and most of the world. Um, so just a very quick bit of the history. You can see that dotted line at the bottom there that wraps around Australia. That's where the native flat oyster or the Australian Garthi oyster, um, their historical range that's been pieced together using old fisheries records. We know that when Europeans colonised Australia, this was a really easy accessible food source. So initially they were fished to virtual extinction. And then um, as their shell, which was remaining, was dredged and crushed up as lime to be used in the roads and buildings that we have in a lot of our capital cities across Australia, we lost that hard substrate that the oyster larvae need to settle on. An oyster's favourite place to live is on the back of another oyster, and once they're there, they don't move. So that's how they are reforming. But when that was removed, it just sort of took away their ability to, to regenerate themselves after we'd stopped um, the really intensive fishing. We only have one natural Angazi reef left in Australia, and it's in Tasmania. Um, there are now, uh, thanks to us and a couple of other groups, some artificial native flat oyster reefs, but that um, one is just in Tasmania there. Um, and yeah, like I said, most of the fish fisheries across Australia um, not quite, didn't quite move all the reefs to extinction, but within Australia we've lost over 95% of the Angazi reefs um, that we um, have pieced together were from the historical range. And across glo globally, all oyster reefs, um, it's estimated that 85% of, of um, oyster reefs have been lost. So it's a pretty significant change and one that's not really in living memory anymore because most of the damage was done hundreds of years ago. So what we did about it is we um, firstly engaged with the local communities. We've started back in 2018, we talked to recreational fishers across the island, people who were visiting, people who um, are here and fish every year. We've got uh, different community groups involved, particularly progress associations in the areas where we were going to be working, talking to the Kangaroo Island growers. There was three, at the time, three um, oyster leases active on Kangaroo Island, um, working with the school. We made um, a really big effort to work with local contractors for all the different components that we could. A lot of this work typically gets done on quite an industrial scale across Australia, but um, it was important to us to come up with not only a local method that works for the oysters that we have on Kangaroo Island, but a local method that can be have some ownership from the community and that can hopefully one day be um, replicated by the community where, you know, hiring Enormous equipment is, is sort of not practical if we want to have a sustainable approach that goes on and on for years to come. So we started off by building our 20 um, mixed reef, um, mixed material reefs, sorry. Uh, we started in early summer of the summer we've just had, so December 2022. We took inspiration from reefs that have been quite successful in the States and other parts of the country and other parts of Australia as well, using limestone as a base. Limestone's pretty similar um, composition-wise to an oyster shell, it's calcium carbonate that they need. So that's a great place to start. We started with a foundation on the seafloor and where we could infill with other um, mater experimental materials, including recycled materials and things that might provide more of a structural, a, a, a structure that mimics a natural razor, uh, sorry, a natural oyster reef. So we had 200 tonnes of limestone um, that we used as our foundation over our two sites at Kingscote and American River. Uh, the other materials that I was talking about that we trialled, we know that on Kangaroo Island in particular, the mainstay of native flat oysters that we still have here come, um, you we typically find them living on the pinnacle or the razor fish that we have. They're quite similar to an oyster reef if you think about this shell sticking up out of the sand. And there's a natural razor fish there that's come out of Western Cove and um, it's got some Angazi oysters on it, it's got an abalone on it. So there's a huge amount of habitat space created by one individual shell. Um, but we are, we certainly have less razor fish beds than we used to as well. So one approach we took was within these limestone patches using um, artificial ceramic razor fish forms made of different ceramic clay compositions. So we um, partnered with the Tasmanian ceramicist and all the work that she makes now gets donated into nature. So she had, uh, she made handmade 1,000 of these um, beautiful razor fish forms and this one's been in for six months. You can see a couple of Angazi um, growing on the top of it there. The more budget version of the handmade, beautiful razor fish forms was terracotta roof tiles. These are recycled unglazed tiles um, that we 
were able to you know reuse um, continue that cycle and worked together with the Kingscote Men's Shed to put them together. We built these structures, we went through a few iterations of how they were going to work and came up with this structure which increases the surface area and maximises the number of hiding holes. So we were quite lucky on Kangaroo Island, which we just know we have lots and lots of fish, which is can be a detriment in this case only because um, the Nazi oysters are easily picked off, leather jackets and crabs and things. So having lots and lots of those um, nooks and crannies and, and hidden spaces seems to be really working well. So these went in on the, um, the reefs as well. When we put them all together, we had uh, patches of limestone interspersed with our other modules. And then over the top, we had a layer of uh, discarded, recycled oyster shell, a lot of which came from the oyster farm shop down in American River. So it's a local product that we've kept out of landfill. And it's, um, like I said, recreating that chemical structure of that and composition that um, native fly oysters are looking for and will attract the natural larvae that are already swimming around in the bay but like I said have for the most part lost that substrate that they can settle on. This is another picture with some of our ceramic razor fish down amongst the limestone as well. This is when they first went in and they were nice and clean. So after six months, we went in and had a look at, our, um, at the oyster reefs and saw how they were going. We did a couple of oyster metric surveys across um, both sites and we were quite surprised by the results. We weren't sure how much natural recruitment there was gonna be, particularly at our site in American River, but we were very pleased with um, some pretty good settlement. Um, they can be a little bit tricky if you get very, very high densities. They can um, outcompete each other and be slower growing. So sort of a, a this sort of density is pretty much what we were looking for, so we got quite lucky there. Um, reasonably good survival, as I said, we've got a lot of fish, so we didn't um, expect there to be 100% survival. So as we were surveying, we were looking for the dead and live oysters, um, and the growth was actually pretty good as well with the biggest oysters at the American Riverside, which was something new to us and to the oyster growers um, who we've talked to, they were surprised by those results as well, so some food for thought there. Um, another thing we did to bolster the reefs, we're quite lucky on Kangaroo Island, as I've mentioned, we do have larvae swimming in the bay, it just doesn't really have much of a place to stay. Most reef projects around Australia rely on hatchery raised spat, which can be very expensive, it can introduce biosecurity problems, so we thought we'd make the best of what we have here. We do have small oysters that, like I said, live on some of those pinna that we still have around, and we sometimes see them on the jetties and different bits of infrastructure. So we installed some spat collecting modules, which we made using oyster shell and oyster baskets, and we um, tacked them down to the seabed at six locations across the Mahian Bay um, to compare how much um, settlement there would be across these different sites. And again, we were really pleased we had settlement across all the sites, almost exclusively nat native flat oysters. So we haven't seen any of the Pacific oysters. Um, some people might be aware that there's some problems with feral Pacific oysters in other parts of South Australia and Tasmania, but there doesn't seem to be something um, occurring yet on Kangaroo Island. Change, we'll see. But these are all native flat oysters of, that have settled on discarded um, Pacific shell. And then we've moved them over to the reef sites where they can give a boost to the natural recruitment there. And, and, and hopefully stay there and grow. Um, the results from, we did another survey of the spat collectors as well across the bay and again we were really happy to see really good settlement across all the sites across eastern and western cove and again we had the biggest oysters at American River. It was another interesting surprise. That was seven months after they'd been put in. We also had a look at the fish habitat. We wanted to know, um, are these reefs working? Have we improved fish habitat? Are recreational fishers gonna have access to more fish? So we put in what we call baited remote underwater video surveys. It's a um, baited bag of, with pilchards at the end of a unit with GoPros attached. We do 60 minute surveys um, across multiple sites on the reef and then also reference sites. And we can see already after six months, um, the reef footage showed improved biodiversity of fish life and improved abundance of fish life at both sites. So that was pretty um, exciting find right off the bat, but we'll continue to look at the fish life there every six months um, at the beginning and then it will sort of decrease as we go on, but keep an eye on them for quite a while. 
and just a little taste of some of the species that we found there at six months. So recreational fish is particularly have been in high numbers, so lots of whiting, <laughs> Um, flathead. We have seen some squid, but none of them came up on the cameras. But every time we go out on there on the boat, they're squid. So I promise they're out there. And here's just some pictures of our modules. This is at King's Coat six months on. So you can see quite a lot of growth on that terracotta tile there. There's a lot of oysters as well as um, that what started as a biofilm and then it's grown into some um, yeah algal habitat. And this is the King's Coat site at 10 months. So you can see more growth again and plenty of whiting. This is the American River site at six months. Similarly, we have some of that growth starting on the tiles. Um, it was a bit slower at American River, but the oysters there, like I said, were bigger and um, seemed to have, maybe they enjoyed that, that slower algal growth. Um, and then that's American River at 10 months. So the um, growth is really caught up there. And you can see on the limestone behind um, that whiting, it's, it's um, into the future, we are, as I've said, we're going to be monitoring the, the sites, um, keeping an eye on the oysters and the fish life. We've also partnered with KAIS, the Kingscote campus, and the outdoor education students there who are working with Oz Ocean, a group um, based over in Adelaide, to create um, monitoring stations. These are rigs that will sit out, they, they do sit out in the water, and we're hoping to have one very soon put out on the Kingscote reef site. It'll monitor the salinity, um, the temperature, turbidity, um, and, and other sort of common metrics that we need, and that'll give us real life, in real time, sorry, information about what's happening out on the reef to help explain um, any events that we see, any changes with the oysters um, and fish as well. We've got a few signs to come up. That's our next little bit of. Um, that's happening this year. We've got an interpretive sign that will go out in Kingscote. We've been working with a local artist um, on the design for that and we'll have some boat ramp signs as well so people heading out to go fishing will have um, the GPS points and a, and a map so that you can find the reefs more easily. For the meantime, those details are all on our website for anyone who wants to find them. Um, we're continuing to work closely with local industry, um, particularly KI shellfish, now KI oysters, um, down in American River. They've um, been very helpful, they've been helping deploy materials, they've um, talked through the process with us right from the beginning and are very um, enthusiastic about working with us in the future and keeping it, um, and learning what we learn off the reefs and, and how that might change because the growers on Kangaroo Island in particular seem very focused on sort of research and development of their um, work as well, which is great. And yeah, we've had lots of interest in media around this project, so um, it would be really great in a year or two to follow that up and, and sort of finish the story. The oysters themselves will take about two years before they mature um, and start reproducing themselves. But um, as the years go on, as I say, those reefs will start to grow on themselves and the patches will connect up. But it's a, it's a slow moving, um, long term goal there. Um, so yeah, what we really learned about this project on Kangaroo Island was just it's, it's a really great place for a project like this. The community support and involvement has been really high. We've had lots of um, different partnerships and um, enthusiasm around this project and what we might do in the future. And um, yeah, we're also really lucky with natural recruitment, which makes it another um, really favourable spot for projects like this where we're not relying on those hatchery staff. We're going to continue to compare the materials at the moment. Terracotta tile seems to be the most popular um, material if you're an oyster, but we will um, yeah, definitely continue to compare and contrast. And the other area that's interesting now is what um, sort of seems to be the step forward is looking at multi-species restoration. It makes sense. The bay here back um, 150 years ago would have been full of oysters, but it wouldn't have just been oyster reefs. It would have been oyster reefs mixed with seagrass, mixed with rocky reef, small patches of bare sand. So looking more at that holistic view of restoration now is um, probably where the future is. And using you know that buffer of oyster reefs um, and other artificial structures to make those sheltered areas where seagrass restoration can work um, with, within those sheltered patches. So that's another thing that we've been talking to with some of the universities in um, Adelaide. They're very interested in what we're doing down here. That's it. That's it. I think it is interesting and worth noting where money comes from for these things. So the money from this project is Commonwealth money um, to our 
national land care partnerships. And it's interesting to note, and while we've got a couple of extra minutes, Kangaroo Island is reasonably unique in the projects that we run through the Landscape Board in that we do really well at attracting project funds, so these sort of funds for what many of the Landscape Boards would see as the more interesting projects. We also collect a levy. Last year we collected about $415,000 worth of levy. Most other Landscape Boards collect a hell of a lot more and they use those levy funds to put towards things that they would see as probably more core, so water resource management, soil and erosion issues, pest plant and animal management, of which I think we do a really good job on Kangaroo Island, but we're not doing as much of it because our levy funds are, are, are tighter. And so most of what you see today are, are project level funds that again, because of, I think Kangaroo Island and, and, and the kind of the iconic destination that it is, we're able to attract from the Commonwealth. So a little bit of a difference to some of the other landscape boards. Um, hello, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Lashmar, I'm the Narrow Leaf Mallet Project Officer, I work for the Kangaroo Island Landscape Board. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Narrow Leaf Mallet Woodland Project or Recovery Project. So the Kangaroo Narrow Leaf Mallet Recovery Project ran for a period of five years. Um, it was in operation up until June of this year. Um, it really was a project that worked closely with the Kangaroo Island landholders to achieve positive benefits to Kangaroo Island and Leaf Mountain Woodland. These are the sort of core outcomes that we work towards. So there was sort of protection of remnant woodland. There was re-establishment of woodland through revegetation. Um, that was working quite closely with landholders, um, getting them to adopt land management practices that benefit the Leaf Mountain Woodland community. And there's also an element of weed control, which focused primarily on bio bale. Um, as Bridal Vale is a known threat to the biodiversity value of Narrowly County Woodland. Um, I won't talk about Bridal Vale component today because I wasn't be here all day. <laughs> um, just a very quick acknowledgement of staff that have worked on the project over the years. I um, just want to particularly shout out the assistance that Veronica and Joe have given the project through the Cardinal Native Plant Nursery. Um, it's basically the plants that they've grown have been used to do the revegetation re and restoration works of the project. So, a quick background around Narrow Leaf Mallee Woodland and why it's so important. Um, so, the woodland community is endemic to Kangaroo Island. Um, Eucalyptus narrowfolia or Kara Narrow Leaf Mallee is found on the southern Flurio, uh, but the actual woodland community that the tree forms is only found on Kara. Uh, it's only found on probably the eastern third of the island. Um, it's listed as critically endangered under the EPBC Act um, because large parts of the community have been cleared historically and converted to farmland. I think it's estimated around 67,000 hectares of community has been cleared historically. Um, what remains is very highly fragmented um, and generally patch sizes are very small. Um, it also provides critical habitat for threatened plants and animals. Um, some of those threatened plants are endemic to Kangaroo Island um, and some are only found in narrowly Mountain Woodland Country. So at the start of the project, one thing we wanted to do was fill some of the knowledge gaps that existed, one of which was we didn't know the full mapped extent of the community. Um, it was thought that there was around 7,000 hectares, but we didn't have anything definitive. Um, the mapping that we currently have is actually very good, um, but the fragmented nature of the landscape means that there's lots of vegetation patches that have been mapped, but don't have any information associated with them, so we don't know what vegetation types exist there. So this is just an example of some of the vegetation mapping we have. Um, this, all the light green areas are the native vegetation that's mapped. Um, you can see on some of them, there is, um, Codes. It's not showing up there. Um, so there's actual codes you can't read because of the size of them. That tells us what type of vegetation is found in that particular patch. Um, but there's an awful lot of patches that have no information attached to them. So we did a bit of desktop analysis and we identified over 900 patches that we didn't have any information about. That could be narrowly familiar woodland. Um, we then went out and were able to ground truth over 700 of those um, and we were able to find that 374 of those were 
power away from that wood lane. So that's 374 patches that hadn't been accounted for in any mapping up until that point. So we took that information, combined it with the existing information that we have, and we were able to, with quite a high degree of certainty, map the full extent of the community. Um, we were able to calculate that it occupies almost 7,880 hectares, but it's split between 832 patches, so it's a very highly fragmented community in the landscape. The red areas there are all the narrowly wooded as we map. So by far the biggest component of the Narrow Leaf Mallee Recovery Project is the on-ground works program. Um, the on-ground works program has been running since before 2005, um, funded, funded under different buckets of money. Um, but obviously under the Narrow Leaf Mallee Project, there was a very strong focus on uh, restoration of Narrow Leaf Mallee woodland. Um, so we're able to work really closely with over 50 landholders um, some we only engage maybe in one year, others we engage every year at the local project. Um, and the Younger Works Program provides funding to landholders so they can fence and protect remnant now left only woodland or plant, establish revegetation, plant seedlings um, to restore or narrowly found woodland or create vegetation corridors and the like. So in terms of the amount of protection that the Younger Works Program was able to work the landholders to achieve was uh, almost 80 kilometres of fencing constructed, um, which helped us protect almost 500 hectares of narrowly family woodland. That's just the map extent of the areas that we helped landholders protect. The red areas are the patches of narrowly family that were protected. Patches ranged in size quite a bit. Some of them were quite small, but only one or two hectares. Um, I think the largest patch that we helped protect was um, just over 100 hectares. In terms of the restoration component, so we helped landholders plant over 37, over 35,000 seedlings, um, which equates to almost 40 hectares of Maryland County woodland restored. Um, plantings range in purpose, I guess. Um, some are purely for biodiversity gain, others are to restore degraded areas. Um, and then you have things like corridor plantings, uh, shallow bed plantings, or contour plantings, you can see there, which are very much fit in with an overall farm land management strategy. This is just the mapped extent of the restoration areas that we got. It's probably a little bit hard to see at that scale, but yeah, all the red areas are the restoration sites that we helped find. Just looking at one site in particular in a bit bit more detail. Um, don't get out to follow individual projects too much, but I was able to follow this one. I think this is a really good example of some of the benefits to the community we've been able to achieve working with landholders. So this is a site, it's part of a farm. Um, it's a very shallow drainage line that runs through the property. Um, the landholder noticed some issues with salinity starting to creep in. Um, we had some salt skulls starting. Um, there was some stream bank erosion starting as well. Um, so they wanted to do something about it to prevent, prevent from getting any worse. So in 2021, they fenced off a corridor through the property, um, planted it out with narrowly family woodland and other species that sort of tolerate the semi saline conditions. Um, I was able to get back in July of 2022, and you can see now that a lot of those plants that have been planted are starting to become established. Um, we've got pretty good survival rates at this site. Um, you also see quite a high coverage of grasses there as well. Primarily that's because stocks have been, have been excluded, but it also means that some of those bare areas, those areas where you're starting to get so salt skulls forming, are now being grassed over. And so the site's starting to improve. And then got back again in September of this year you can really see that this site is really starting to become established now. Uh, overstory trees in particular are looking very healthy. You've got even more cover of grasses. And also some of those stream bank erosion areas are starting to become vegetated as well. So that site is really on the map. Um, another site that sort of looks at a bit of integrated management, different strategies implemented in the same site to achieve best results. 
So this is a property which has a very vast network of riparian narrowleaf mallee that runs through it. Um, it's never been fenced. Um, it's always been stocked. Um, it's actually still in pretty good condition considering um, the history. Um, so they wanted to protect it as best they could. So I started off in 2020 by fencing the entire site, uh, which is no small undertaking because there's over 10 kilometers of fencing just in this one property. Um, I think the landholder said there's about 40 strainer assemblies in that 10 kilometers as well. <laughs> so pretty big undertaking. Um, but you can see here, we've got some issues with salt scalding, salinity and erosion. So to address those areas, in 2022, they came out and planted them with Narrowleaf Valley Woodland and other Melaleuca shrubland, which looks all occurs naturally on the site, to try and um, deal with those issues with erosion and stuff, similar to the previous project. And then again, there's future plans to do more work on the property. Um, so it's been really good working with landholders that are very invested in different approaches to get the best results and look after their property. This is just a breakdown of sort of the ongoing works investment. Um, so we've been able to give out almost $360,000 worth of grants to landholders. Uh, I think we've achieved some pretty good outcomes for that investment. <coughs> Working alongside the narrowly or the on-ground works project, we've also been able to start looking into providing uh, sort of more involved services for landholders. So producing management plans so that landholders can actively manage senescent narrowleaf valley woodland. So senescence is a natural um, process. It's just where vegetation becomes very old and starts to die back. Um, as that happens, you start to lose biodiversity. So your understory species drop out over time and you're left with, particularly in narrowleaf valley, you're left with these stands of almost a monoculture of just overstory trees. I'm sure people have seen network managers like that around the place. It's quite a widespread issue. The problem with that over time is that eventually those patches will just die out completely. Um, we get strong winds that come and blow trees over. They pull the roots out when they're blown over and then they don't grow back. So the way we can treat those areas is by introducing some sort of disturbance. Um, and the the two types of disturbance we can introduce are either pollarding, which is cutting off the trees at the base, um, which forces them to reshoot. That's good for things like shelter belts, not so good for big patches. Um, but for big patches, we really want to look at introducing ecological burning, which again forces the plants to reshoot and also stimulates the germination of soil seed bank to increase biodiversity. So you can see here, this is the result of a shelter belt that's been pollarded. And everything's been cut off at the base and you can see all those trees are readily reshooting so over time they will grow up into nice healthy narrow leaf mallees again and also opens up that area for additional sunlight so that any soil sea bank that still remains has a chance to germinate and you get a more biodiverse shot of it there and this is just results from um, an ecological burn that landholder undertook on Dudley Peninsula you can see really good regeneration of narrow leaf valley there's also quite good seedling germination at that site too. Can't see from the scale of that photo. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of engagement from landholders as part of this project. Um, outside of the engagement through Ongoing Works, there's been also lots of times where either myself or Veronica or Joe at the nursery have talked to landholders and given out um, technical advice about management of the family. And one of the things we did towards the end of the project to assist with that was produce these uh, narrow leaf mallee management guidelines for landholders. So this is a document that basically is intended for anyone who's got narrow leaf mallee on their property that's looking at doing some sort of management of, to come in, pick up, and it has all the information they'll need to do whatever it is that they're looking at doing. Um, so that's not currently available, but it will be available um, in the near future. So if anyone's wanting to get a hold of a copy of that, it will be available soon. And that will be up to me. For me on, on Kim's, one of the things that I feel really strong about 
the work that the landscape boards are able to do is just how regionally located it all is. So Kim's a Lashmar, which means he's been here for literally forever. Um, <laughs> and those are places <coughs> like the back of his hand. One of the things that we need in order to deliver any of our projects, and Alex hasn't been forever, but she's now in the community and understands the people who are connected to the project that we're delivering. Kim's also in the same boat. In order to deliver any of what we do, we need to work with people. Um, and so having regionally located staff from the government department, of which we are, is really critically important, I think. The other thing that I just wanted to note on Kim's presentation is that there is a hell of a lot of support that the Landscape Board provide, but it's very much also a landholder-led project. And while we've put in, I think the figure was 360000 or something like that, that would at least be dollar for dollar in terms of landholder contribution. In large part because the agreements that we issue only pay for half the work to be delivered. But that's just the physical costs of the stuff, not the landholders' time to engage in the program. So one of the things that would be really interesting to do would be to do a bit of a, a cost analysis. If, if we put in a buck, how much comes back from the landholders? So I think that's a really strong part of, of what we're seeing. And also the thing that I love about this, and I think we see it with a few of ours, is that kind of level of landholder agency coming back in there. The burning that Kim, you're looking at there is a very different type of burning and a different intention to what possibly we're talking about in some of the other parts of the island where we're looking for some, uh, some, some hazard reduction based on the 1920 experience. But what Kim's shown through this is that there are actually ways that we can work through the approvals processes to do things like ecological burns, um, which is, I think, a really powerful tool and something that we can start to tell the community about a bit more over time, keeping in mind that it's a different purpose necessarily what, what Kim's looking at. All right, fantastic. Well, um, we'll move on to the next one and, and, and introduce Paul Rogers, who's our biodiversity manager. Thanks, Will. Thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Much appreciated. Today, I'm going to give the story, which is really the story um, developed by our team who works on the Kangaroo Island Done Up uh, program. We've got Hannah, Michaela, Kelly, and Paul Jennings, who has uh, historically led the program. Now you can't run a program like this without having a lot of support and I mean support from funding agencies and support from the community and support from your colleagues in, in Kangaroo Island. I think that's really important to acknowledge up front. Now the other day I heard a story about how people, when people come to Kangaroo Island, one of the things they are thinking about is the Dunna, the Kangaroo Island Dunna, because it's a very special little mammal. And I thought about it and I thought, well, for the amount of people that come to Kangaroo Island to visit and have a wildlife experience, how many, people, how many of them actually get to see a Dunna? I think it's a, it's a big part of, big part of traveling to a, an amazing place like this is just knowing or hoping that these species are still surviving and still thriving. I think that's also for landholders, knowing that you've got these species of small mammals that are otherwise struggling in other places, you've got them on your property and that they're, they're here but it really does give people a, a good feeling in their soul and, and they, it makes them feel good. So I think that's something to something really worth thinking about as we work through this. So there's our team up there on the left, as I, I just named them before. The Dunnart's a really interesting small mammal. It's a Dasyurid, and you've probably all heard that word before. You think it's essentially a, almost a mouse or rat-sized animal with a giant set of choppers is the best way to think about it for me. You know, um, how did that come to be? This species is related to things like the Tassie tiger, the Tassie devil, the quolls, all these slightly larger bodied species, but has got these, um, yeah, this giant set of incisors, which is fairly unique in itself when you come to think about it. And we're lucky enough down in the western part of the island to have a population of this species. Now, at face value, when you think about a program like, you think, like this, you think, well, why are we working on Dunnarts? You know, like, why, why is a Dunnart so important? But there's a, history, there's a history behind this, okay? So, Kangaroo Island has a history of extinction of small mammals. That's a fact. We've seen in the fossil record, by digging in caves and other activities, that, you know, species like Dunnart are actually vulnerable to extinction. The Threatened Species um, Strategy Action Plan by the Australian Government back in 2015 and 16 highlighted that. Now, there are 20 mammals that they, they thought could potentially um, 
be very vulnerable to extinction. And the Kangaroo Island Dunna, as you can see down the bottom there, was ranked at about 14 in terms of its average likelihood of going extinct over the next 20 years. So some researchers um, from around Australia determined that that was about a, a probability, if you like, of 22%, which is not a, not a great report card, really, when you think about it. There's a whole set of reasons behind that, which I'll go into in a minute. But, you know, and, and we're not, the other thing to acknowledge here is we're not the first people to work on Dunarts. There are other NGOs working on Dunarts. We've got um, National Parks and Wildlife and DW. We've got other researchers who work on Dunarts. It's a community of researchers, and largely a lot of those are actually in the recovery team for Dunarts. So it's good to acknowledge that. There were very few records. So written records up until 2016, and largely they were known from only 19 sites on Kangaroo Island down in the western end. So <laughs> Western Kangaroo Island has this fairly high or quite high fire frequency, and it's around about on average 10 to 12 years. That is also the area, that western area of the island is also the area where Kangaroo Island Dunarts like to live. And that's largely because of a whole range of things like the, the rainfall. It's got a reasonably high rainfall for South Australia, um, a couple hundred mils higher than the rest of the, or the eastern part of the island. It's high, you know, it's hundreds of feet above sea level. The vegetation complexity is different. And the thing about it out there in that in that Banksia country and that ironstone country is there's a lot there's a lot of sort of ground story complexity that Dunarts like. There's lots of xanthorias, lots of stumps, lots of ant nests, all this, you know, low level stuff that, that Dunarts like. And in that 2019 and 20 bushfire that ripped across more than half of the island, about around about 96% of the Kangaroo Island Dunart habitat um, was destroyed. So we think, or well, modelers think at least, and, and researchers have done survey work on this species, think that that, that um, population is around about 500 to 2,500 individuals. So at 500, many species are struggling genetically um, in terms of being able to um, grow their population. So it's species like this that really need support in terms of their recovery. And this is acknowledged across a whole range of mammals and birds. These are not new things. Okay, most of us know about feral cats. They're probably the biggest threat to biodiversity in Australia right now. I think it's understood by the Australian government. That's, that's a fact. We've determined that over the over 1,600 feral cats that we've removed as part of this program through, through strategic cat control, that around about, on a per annum basis, that activity alone probably saves the lives of around about 1.4 million small vertebrates. That's significant. So our team has applied some new technologies um, to actually set up feral cat um, cage arrays that now can cover huge swathes of the island. So we've been able to, through working with landholders and a whole range of other partners, been able to work through and remove, as I said, over 1,600 cats. Other groups down in the west have also removed a fair share of cats, so we think overall we've probably removed around about 2,500 to 3,000 cats since the fires, which is a significant number. We still think there are thousands of cats spread across the island. So they're a significant threat. So in terms of Dunarts, the team has been doing these island-wide surveys of 280 sites to map the pre-bushfire um, distribution. Been working on about 32 private properties and across 13 plantations. The Dunarts, through various methods, which I won't go into detail on, but we're using fairly standard methods for small mammals and birds and reptiles, which are these drift line surveys. It's a lot of work to set those up. But anyway, we've basically determined that through quite a bit of survey effort, that they probably occupy around about 19% of the island, um, which is, yeah, a significant, a significant increase since the pre-fire estimate was around about 8% of the island. So some of those early findings have basically informed development and implementation of what we hope to be a long-term strategy for monitoring. 
So here you can see the history of all of the sites that have been surveyed um, for Kangaroo Island Dunarts. The yellows are the total, so that's the total number of surveys that have been looked across the island um, for Dunarts. And then where we've got the detections are the red dots. So you can see, it's, as I said before, it's really down in that western end where there's greater rainfall and um, higher veg complexity. So there's a long-term management, a long-term monitoring strategy. There's 70 sites that we're still looking at today. Um, Hannah's actually out there today surveying with the team. There's yeah 70 odd sites, and with that within that there's 60 core sites that includes 10 historical sites that have been managed and um, monitored by various people over time. So this was all largely based on some methods um, by Rosie Honan, which was that she worked on a NESP funded program back in back in um, about 2018 or so. And so we, we're rerunning the survey type that was developed, which is a repeatable survey. And we can then, from that, we can come up with a um, measurable and you know, monitorable, if you like, index of the population size. So in terms of metrics, so things we can measure and grasp to understand how the population's going. We've got camera arrays in the landscape and we can come up with relative measures of detection of Dunark presence absence, if you like. And from that, the guys have been doing, from the seasonal surveys, they've now developed a trend, and we can see that there's a slight uptick, if you like, in that Dunark occupancy. And um, it certainly decreased in the unburnt habitats and increased in some of those burnt habitats, which is, yeah, quite, quite um, encouraging in some ways. But, preliminary data, I just want to stipulate that. We're hoping to rerun and continue to rerun this type of analysis, um, including a number of different factors, so explanatory things that we can try and work out what these trends are driven by. And some of those are things like height, you know, elevation, the severity of the fire and its history, rainfall, vegetation, um, community type, and also you know, how much, how much we're getting in terms of feral cat occupancy across those key habitats. Now, the guys with partners with zoos and others, I won't run through all of the methodology behind tracking because there's a fair bit to it, but effectively they've tracked a few animals now. Um, one of the most important things to do when you work on small mammals is get them in the hand. You have to be able to get them in the hand to learn about them effectively. <coughs> You can track them, you can understand their reproductive biology, their size, their growth. Until you can do that, you really are up against it. And that's been the, the real distinction between our team um, and, the, and the huge step forward that our team has made in that they've been able to really get them in the hand through the methods that they've been using. That's, it's critical. One of the benefits of getting them in the hand is attaching little trackers to them. So you can basically put them out and learn about their lives and their behaviours. We found they've got this really small home range, it's only around about 50 metres, but they will travel over half a K or so, getting around to different areas to feed or, or meet their buddies. The other, come on in. The other really cool thing about them is they're communal, so they, they don't mind getting in underneath pieces of tin and, and you know within their natural habitats and under roof tiles and things like that with, with all of their friends and their family groups, if you like. Um, and, and as I said, again, the guys have been trialling all these different methods to work out um, what they prefer in terms of their natural den types or different types of artificial dens. Two minutes, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right. How do I fire this little? I think I can just click it and make it go. So this little fella here has actually um, got a tag. So it's wearing a radio collar. You can see that aerial poking up. So they, they get in and under leaf litter. So we think, you know, you're having that complex leaf litter that's multiple years old is really quite important in terms of their habitat. They also burrow, so they make little nesting sites and little whirls. Um, so yeah, quite, you know, that habitat complexity is obviously really important for them. All right, so another project like that dovetails into the work that the team's been doing is they've been looking at artificial refuge uses. So. In terms of um, looking at, like one of the questions around that is what are the thermal suitabilities? What are the types of materials you could use to put out in the environment to actually be artificial refuges 
in periods where they may need extra help in terms of habitat. And they've tried that in different burnt and unburnt habitat types in the core area where Dunnarts live, if you like. And they've used a few different ones and they've found that um, they have been using those different, habit, uh, different um, you know, artificial habitats has really helped the Dunnarts in terms of um, providing them with you know, new, new homes or temporary homes that have effectively um, been used. So you can see there that at some of those unburnt or burnt sites rather, 100% of the artificial habitats that they put out were actually visited by Dunnarts and around about 75% were used. So they got under there and took shelter. There's a few other stats there as well. We had 100% of the natural dens were visited at burnt sites. So this is in a burnt, in a burnt area trial. And 35% of the artificial refuges were visited at unburnt sites. 50% of the natural dens were visited at unburnt sites also. So you can see that graph over there. We've got burnt, unburnt in the artificial refuge on the left and burnt, unburnt in the, nat in the natural dens on the right. So you can see those trends there are fairly evident. I'll quickly just nip through this one. Effectively, the guys also looked at thermal suitability of different materials and they found from corrugated iron sheets laid out in the landscape and terracotta, the suitability of those were generally the same. So you can use recycled materials, if you like, it's the key thing for this, to enhance Dunnart habitat in some of these areas. So in terms of fire resistance, artific artificial refuge temperatures and structural integrity were monitored during a prescribed burn. And some of those results showed that artificial refuge types can actually provide that protection for Dunnarts in those situations. So again, new learnings and working in with um, National Parks and Wildlife there quite closely, Tony's team to actually get some of those answers. So what's happening now? Um, you know, we're obviously at a bit of the end of a funding cycle. The team's still out there doing the surveys, um, continuing to get that extra data point for occupancy. We've got a lot of information to analyse, so we're working with partners to get some of the numbers crunched, to redo the distribution maps and work out where Dunnarts are now, three years after fire. We're continuing with that feral cat control and using the new technologies to enhance and improve the efficiency of that. Paul's team is um, currently working with the National Parks guys to run traps as many days as possible over the course of a week, which is a great partnership and also just working closely at a national level to support all the different recovery actions that we think are priorities, that the Australian government thinks are priorities also, that we think priorities at the local level and just doing our bit there, if you like, in the region for um, the conservation and management of this and other species that occupy similar habitats. So yeah, just some acknowledgements there. We work with, you know, as I said in the first slide, we work with a whole range of different people on this. We really thank the people that allow us onto their private properties to work on this. We know it's extra time out of their day and um, we appreciate the keenness and, the, and, and just that um, goodwill, if you like, to actually let us out on there and to trap and and also on the plantations. There's a lot going on on the plantations, as we know, but we've, we've still maintained a great relationship out there. We're still able to trap cats, get in around the fringes and do the things that we need to do in those areas. So, yeah, thank you. As is my one, a couple of quick comments from me. Um, Tony, you asked about boom and bust. It does seem like we've seen a bit of a boom of, of Dunnarts after the fires. and. I think some people even go as far to start saying, well, is it even needed? Did we need to do this, this, this program intervention? The thing is, and as you'd all see, we don't know because we've only been doing really the intense monitoring and the intense control work for a period of time, a short period of time. One of the challenges that we have with the vagaries of government, of which we're, we're, we're part of it, is doing things over the long term. One of the projects that we, we run is the Glossy Black Cockatoo Program, which Carl Air heads up. We've been doing it for a very long time, so we start to get a good understanding actually of what's happening with that species. For the species like the Dunnart, we still really have no idea. Um, and so to continue to 
look for and attract that ongoing funding is critically important, I think, to, to continue the, the preservation of the Dunna. I would also just take the opportunity to single out Heidi Groffin, who runs Kangaroo Island Land for Wildlife. So we are talking about the landscape board projects today. There's been other significant interventions that have happened across Kangaroo Island, particularly <coughs> in, in Land for Wildlife's area, uh, in and around working with private landholders uh, who have also done significant work, both for the preservation of the Dunard and the control of feral cats. So just to, 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 to call out that acknowledgement.